All right, so we, we turn to the Word of God and we conclude our study of Matthew that we began back in 2019 with these, yeah, that's enough out of you. Who said, who did that? There's someone back there, I think it was Sam. <laughs> we conclude Matthew 20 with the, the final words of what Jesus says to his disciples. Remember these words are given from the, as a, a encapsulation, a, you know, an abridgment. It's got to be that, that uh, these are the precise words, but they aren't the only words. And, uh, and Matthew remembers these, and he says, oh, he talked a lot. Luke says he talked a lot about the kingdom of God during those five, 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. What 40 days they must have been. What, what a glory. You know, it's like your every dream, the greatest possible dreams of your life, all of them suddenly realized and standing in front of you for these disciples. Jesus is not going to be an earthly king. He is the son of God. And they look at him and it's, it's vindication, it's, it's power, it is everything life could offer for their future and then eternity with with the son of God who is their brother but it's not simply the offer of Jesus to his 12 or even to the 12 and the women or to the however many disciples were in the upper room at the time of Pentecost 120 it's an offer that Jesus makes to you and it is the great glory of our lives to know Jesus as disciples of his so stand with me and we're going to read Matthew 28 18 through 20 Closing with his words, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and it is about Jesus, and it is the word of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we will know the truth of it and the power of it, and that you'll give me the ability to express the glory of it, and that we will receive it and live in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't think there's anything in the Christian life or in the life of a pastor that's what would be called a valedictory. The valedictorian at a high school gives a speech and it's a valedictory. It's a formal type of speech that says I've won, the end has come, I've won. Perhaps the only time in the Christian life that there is a valedictory as if you die for the sake of Christ and you die with his name on your lips. And then that would be a valedictory. It would be a concluding statement that I have won. But for the rest of us, our hope is to bring our, our ship safely home to heaven and not make shipwreck along the way. Not allow our pride or our lust or our greed to ruin us. And I'm afraid that it's very, very common for men who have made a profession of, of being a Christian to, once they are no longer in the profession, to, to not live it. And so I, I echo with Paul the words, I, I, I seek, I do not want to make a shipwreck of my life. And that's my goal in the years ahead, not to make a shipwreck, but to continue to fear the Lord and to speak of him. So there is a in a sense, a kind of finality to this message, but I said it's like a father kissing his daughter at the front of a church. It's not the end. It's a new phase and a new call. But I do want to speak in a way I, I don't generally do purposely. I want to speak from personal experience of Christ in concluding our look at the Gospel of Matthew. I think it's almost inconceivable, even to you, 
let alone the average Christian in America today, what it must have been like to be with Christ as a disciple in his days on earth. Inconceivable, the power. Inconceivable, the glory of being around this, this holy, perfectly holy and wise man. To know him personally, to accompany him, as he went on his way, always sacrificing for others, always staying behind, saying, I'll tend to the crowd, you go on, always doing the perfect thing. To know him personally like this, to accompany him in ministry, to work with his power, which he so liberally gave to them. He said, here, my power, take it. You're going to do greater things than I've done. Take my power, take the Holy Spirit. I have said it before, but I think I want to repeat myself. I'm I'm the age where you expect it. It kind of left me cold to walk in Israel. A couple of years ago, when many of us went there, left me cold to follow in the footsteps of Christ. We went to the garden tomb, and I said, okay. And same in Bethlehem. Same in Nazareth. Yeah, all right. Oh, cool. That's the, perhaps the hill that they're going to throw him off of. Sea of Galilee. Oh, you know, the boat there that they'd recovered and they put in, in, into a secure area with, you know, controlled environment so it won't fall further apart. They think could have been like the boats the disciples used. That's cool. But I was unmoved time and again. And I I think for a good reason. And that reason is that Jesus, I just, I have to say to you, Jesus says to us, to those of us who are his disciples, his parting words to his disciples and his words to you today are, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you. It's not I am there or I was there or I'm, I am with you. I am with you with you always even to the very end of the age so jesus is with his disciples he if you follow him he is with you every bit as much as he was with matthew and peter and john he's here he's not in capernaum he's here he's with you he tells us he is with us personally He's with us powerfully in his power, and he's with us perpetually until the end of the age, in exactly the same way he was with the 12 and the women who accompanied them. You are his follower. You are his friend. You are a fellow son of God, a brother of Christ. Imagine, you get to say my brother about Christ. He's risen, he's in his glory. He's in his power. He'll come as king with trumpets striding across the clouds. And you'll say, my God, my God, my Savior. And you'll also say, and my brother, and my great dear brother. He is with you exactly as he was with the 12 and those women who accompanied them. He is with us as our Lord and Master, as our friend. He's with us as the Son of God. And he loves us. So the promises he gives the 12 are for you. He tells the 12 over and over again that they're going to do great things. And this is before these 40 days. He says, I'm going to give you power and you will do great things, great things. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says to the disciples in John 14, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to the Father, whatever, whatever I ask, you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Consider the horizons that you haven't even cast your eyes on in your life. Think of the dreams that someone who took this as the very word of God to him or herself. 
the dreams that would fill the mind of a person who was convinced that Jesus meant this. Don't be happy with what we have here today. Don't be happy. It is so far less than what we should have and could have. And I am grateful for what we have, and I know you all are as well. But it is less. We have not won the world. We haven't won Toledo yet. The glory of Christ needs to be proclaimed, his lordship given evidence in our lives in a way that wins the world. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now you know those words, and you know that Luke repeats these words, but slight differences in Luke's account, a slightly different occasion, but he says almost exactly the same thing. It seems like this was something that Jesus said on numerous occasions. I mean, he made this comment not just once in the Sermon on the Mount, but on the Sermon, the Sermon on the Plain, and other times we don't have recorded. This was the kind of thing Jesus said, so he says in Luke at a different occasion, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. So, and that, now the difference. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish, but Matthew said it was a loaf, right? <laughs> this time he says for a fish, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, no mention of an egg in Matthew, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, now this is new, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Christ promised to these disciples who follow him, his initial 12, is that they will have the full power of heaven at their disposal. You will do greater things than I have done when the Spirit comes upon you, Jesus says. It's good that I go away because when I send the Spirit, he will come upon you and you will do greater things than I have done. Christ's promise is that he is with us. He is with us. He makes it clear the extent of his being with us in three ways. First, Christ is directly and personally, knowingly, with all those who love him and serve him. This is the message. He delivers his message to disciples in these wonderful days between his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And those were wonderful days, but they must also have been days of disappointment because he says, hey, hey, I do have to go. And so they're, they're bittersweet days and they're going to lose him. But they've gained him. Days of disappointment, days of joy. Jesus is not back for good. He's back for just a few weeks. And he warns them. He says, don't cling to me. I've got to ascend to be with my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Now, I want to, I want to say to you something on, on this basis, that in John, Jesus warns Mary not to cling to him after she finds him, the resurrected Christ. She comes up and she, she clings to him. He says, don't cling to me. I have to return to heaven, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So he, he makes it clear that you're with me, and you're with me in heaven. I'm with you, you're with me. My God is your God. My Father is your Father. But don't hang on to me. Don't hang on. Don't cling to me. Now, you, you may find that what I say is, what I'm about to say is, you may think it heresy or at least wrong. But your goal as a Christian is not to cling to Christ. 
Christ has a hold of you. Your goal is to serve him. Am I making sense? You don't cling to him and say, I need you, I need you. And the whole of Christianity is clinging to Christ. I cling to him. Me, this weak and, and feeble person, I cling to Christ. I cling to him. I need him, I need him. You listen to the music, the worship music of our day. It's all about clinging to this lovely Jesus. I cling to him. I cling to Christ. We have popular poetry, probably not in any of our homes, but I remember seeing it so often in the homes of when I was first a pastor in the homes. Treacly poems on the walls of our elderly, but we have the equivalent in our lives, like that footsteps poem, <laughs> where, oh, it was a hard life, and in the hardest points, Jesus, Jesus seemed not to be walking by my side, you know, footprints in the sand, and the years are demarked by the footprints, and at certain of the hardest points, there's just one set of footprints, and you say to Jesus, why did you leave me then? Why did you leave me? And he says, oh, I didn't leave you. I carried you through those. That's not true. That's not true. It's not like we walk side by side, but at the moments of greatest need, suddenly we become weak, and he carries us. At those points, he gives us strength so that we walk in faith. We don't cling to a gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who takes us through this hard life by comforting us like you'd comfort a, a little duck. Yeah, my Rihanna. You, what you don't know is their talk about my loving little animals led me to be given three ducks last night. How many of you saw the three ducks that... As many of you didn't, thank goodness I found a very wonderful foster home. <laughs> Is that you, Parker and Jeanette? They're in a good home. They are being taken care of by a loving family, all right? <laughs> we are not harassed little sheep needing a gentle shepherd to guide us through this dark and menacing world. We're not. It's not the talk of Christ. We are in all things more than conquerors. He is with us, not as a comforter, but as a guide. His word is given to us not to make us feel that, oh, I can retreat from this, this world that's menacing and dark into the word of God and find comfort. We will find comfort in the word of God, but it's so that we go out and do the battle. The word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It is not a retreat. It is a guide to going forward. It is a sword. It is something that we use and wield. It is something that we follow and we make our way through this world with Christ. Now, I want to make the point that this is a personal promise to the 12 and the, the women who followed them. I think this is indisputable. It's evident in the circumstances of his saying it. It's evident in the way they lived in the decades to come. Jesus was with them. They died with Jesus. Not one of them didn't die with Jesus with him. Even John, who it appears was not martyred, of, of all the disciples, one, the one we're pretty certain didn't die a, light, a death of martyrdom. But at the end of his life, he's given the revelation that we just spent many weeks reading through. Jesus was with him all the way to the end. But you may make the mistake of thinking that upon the death of the 12 and his immediate followers of those, those days when he was here on earth, that this promise that was personal to them becomes a corporate promise and it becomes a, a promise to the church and not to individuals. So let me say to you that that can't be the meaning of what Jesus says. It can't be. Because he says, I am with you. He is speaking to individuals in a way that is reassuring. But it's obvious that he's not just speaking 
to those individuals, and what in this statement makes it clear he's not just speaking individually to them. And the fact that it's not individual to them is that if you convert it into a corporate promise, you know, like it's, he's with the church. Well, of course Christ is with his church. They don't need to be told that. Their worries aren't about the church. They're about their own lives. It's kind of a, what we call a logical error known as a tautology to say something that's so obvious, you know. A tautology is the, the survival of the fittest, right? Do you understand why it's a tautology? That evolution teaches survival of the fittest. Well, of course the fittest survive. Who else is going to survive but the fit ones? It's not a bolt of lightning from above of realizing this. Nor should we be surprised that Jesus says, I will be with you, and it applies to us personally. It can't apply to everyone if he's doing that. God is the God of this world. It's not a promise that goes to everyone and everything. God is always with his creation. Jesus sustains it by his word. It's a personal promise. It's obviously the point of it. But what in this promise makes it clear that it's not just to the twelve? He says to them, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. He knows that they're not going to be alive at the end of the age, that the end of the age is further off. He says, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Now, Jesus is not just with us personally, but he's with us powerfully. He's with us as the Son of God, no longer in mortal flesh. He retains mortal flesh in heaven. The holes are still visible. But he resumes his heavenly crown. This is inescapable, biblically. Yet somehow it's morphed over the centuries into something that's biblically obvious to something that's practically denied. That's true, we say, but we can't really expect his power. We really can't expect to overcome the world. We really can't expect to do greater things than he did because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Yes, he said that, but we can't expect it. Jesus is with us both personally and powerfully through his spirit. The spirit that came upon him and gave power to him in his earthly ministry is given to you. That spirit, if you are a follower of Christ, resides in you. That spirit that he said, when you receive it, you will do greater works than he has done. Those are his words, resides in you. So why are you looking so low? And why am I looking so low? Why are our eyes not far out there dreaming of what Christ will do? Now I know, as I come to the end of my time as senior pastor here, I want to say to you, I love you because so many of you have been looking out far. So many of you have. And you've been a challenge to me and your faith has encouraged me as pastor, as a man, as a father. But all of us need to look further into the future, into the power of God than we have looked. He is not done. This world is his world, not Satan's world in the end. And he has called us to win. Third, Jesus is with us perpetually to the end of the age, personally with us as he was with the 12. At the end of the age, he refers to it in his parable of the tares. He says, the harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are angels. Clearly, the end of the age is when he returns. He will be with us until he returns. There's no time that Jesus is not with his followers. There's no time when they're separated from him. There's no rapture like that. You understand what I'm talking about? The rapture, the idea that he goes and he pulls his people out of the world and if you're alive and you come to know him, then you're sort of abandoned to the darkness. It's not his word. Jesus is with us until the end. So what does this mean for you and for me? And these are words that I want to leave as I close. As I have considered life and considered the calling of a pastor and a father it's come to me 
that fighting sin is both necessary because Jesus demands it and yet impossible. You can't defeat the power of sin. Now, you may say to me, David, what do you mean? You are always calling us not to sin. And I say, I know. But the battle against sin is not the battle of looking evil in the face for a lifetime. The battle that wins against sin is looking to Jesus and understanding the love of Christ. Understanding the love of God in Christ and finding joy. And the Christian life is a life of joy, not a life of fighting sin. God wants you to have joy. God wants your life to be filled with joy. And he surrounds obedience to him, which the Bible speaks of as fruitfulness, with joy. I've said it before, but I think it's just so true that we need to be reminded that God loves fruitfulness of every sort. And every form of fruitfulness is surrounded with joy delight is there anything more delightful than holding a new baby <laughs> no is there anything more delightful than the act that brings about the birth of a child huh. is there anything more beautiful than a than a mother with a baby or a mother holding a, in her tum, stomach a, a baby is there anything more beautiful than a rose. Look at how the flowering precedes the fruit, the smells, the joys of fruitfulness. Think about how Jesus, in, a, in a, the miracle that Jesus did that is absolutely Mr. James's favorite, all right? Jesus, in his first public miracle, made wine for a wedding. You think God doesn't want you to have joy? When his very first public miracle is to give joy to a wedding? You ever think about that? What a tremendously <laughs> uh, scandalous thing that is for Jesus to have done. And you remember the amount. <laughs> it was like 200 gallons of wine. If we had a wedding and we had 200 gallons of wine, you know what would be going on? A lot of church discipline, let me tell you. <laughs> you really love that parable, don't you, Mr. James? <laughs> I mean that miracle. <laughs> That's why you shook your head. It's not a parable. <laughs> God wants you to have joy. So it's not enough to turn off the internet. That's fighting sin. But in your home... Every battle against sin is a battle for joy. So you turn off the internet and it means you don't spend time sitting at home on your tablet or playing a game. It means you spend time with your children. And they grow to love you. And you grow to love them. And it's rich. And it's powerful. You fight sin by finding joy. Pursue joy. Don't fight sin. Uh, you understand I'm exaggerating to a certain degree here. Yeah, you have to say no to sin. But if you're trying to say no to sin and no to sin and you're not knowing the joy of Jesus Christ, you're not going to win. Second, I want to say to you, one of the joys of being the pastor here has been the way that you have very often challenged me by your willingness to do things that I hesitate to call you to do because it seems like, it seems like people will go crazy with rebellion if you actually stand in front of them and say you should do this like you should look at bearing children as a joy rather than a burden well God sent Mike and Sharon Arndt back in the early days of our church who went around preaching it so that I felt comfortable preaching it you know and Matt and Adrian who 
who said, oh, I guess we weren't done at two. And isn't Amelia Simpson glad they didn't end at two? <laughs> um, you don't know how, how powerful God is and how committed he is to you until you test him. So go further. Test him further. Do more. Take greater risks. You don't know until you test him what he will do. And what I've learned is that in every area in my life where I have trusted God and said, I'll do it. It's not like at the moment it's easy. Very often you think, oh, this was a stupid decision. You know? I remember for years thinking, okay, I'll spend one more year in Toledo. One more, and then I'm gone. And who would think that saying, okay, God, I know you want me to be here for another year would lead into a life that's been the most joyful life of a pastor ever. You know, at least that's how I view it. God takes the things that you say you'll do because you trust him, and he makes them the greatest things in life. Those of you who went beyond the number that you thought you were going to have of children, <laughs> which of the ones that are beyond the number you thought you were going to have is your greatest delight now? Can you imagine life without that child? Can you imagine it? So test God. And... Finally, let me say that if your home is not a home that's filled with joy, then you need to pursue Christ in a way that you're not. And this is true of your marriage, and it's true of your children. If your children don't love God, all right, and they may be coming. God works in his time. But if there is a sense that there's not an enjoyment of the things of God in the home, then you need to love God more and tr trust him more and pursue him and his goodness more. Because the life of a Christian home is by far and away the happiest possible life just happiness, pure happiness, love, forgiveness, no bitterness, all that we need, because God does give us everything we need when we trust him, just the happiest possible life, because we're cared for by an omnipotent God with a son who loves us. So if your home and your marriage is not happy, then I encourage you to seek Christ together. Pray with each other, Make sure that your home is filled with joy. It should be a joyful home. So I'm grateful to God for the privilege of having been your pastor as senior pastor, for the privilege of remaining your pastor for years to come. I'll be down here, down there, teaching Sunday school next week. Things aren't changing, but they have changed. And it is with great joy that I commend you, commit, commend you to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray.